uh, I just want to say this is an amazing panel of writers here, not only because of uh, their distinguished work, but each one of them is an expert in a different kind of writing. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, now how am I going to pull this all together? We have a nonfiction writer and a, someone who's a specialist in children's writing and a novelist. And then I thought, well, let's just let each one of them talk a little bit about what they do first. Let me introduce them. Tracy Kidder is a Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize winning nonfiction author. His most recent book is Strength in What Remains. And that is an amazing story, if you haven't read it. It's an amazing story of one man's journey to America and back home again. Eleanor Lipman is a novelist known for her contemporary comedies of manners. Her latest novel is The Family Man, which is a warm and funny tale about the relationship between a man and his long lost stepdaughter. And Jane Yolen is a well-known author of children's literature from picture books like Pretty Princess Pig to graphic novels like Foil to chapter books like Snow and Summer. And she also writes science fiction. And since Eleanor and Jane both write poetry as well, I don't know about you, Tracy. Well, we'll get to your poetry. <laughs> we'll explain that in a moment. But, uh, uh, but I, think, I think as a result, we have every genre of literature represented here on this stage. So uh, that's why I want each one of you to talk a little bit about your genre, what you do. Um, and let me start with you, Jane, because uh, I met somebody today who said, Jane Yolen is so prolific, she could probably write a book while you're interviewing her tonight. <laughs> I read that you have written 300 books, is that right? Over. Over 300 books. So before we go anywhere, how do you do that? How do you write 300? I mean, that just is an amazing book. I used to say one at a time. <laughs> but since I spent this morning working on the copy edits of two books, I'm not sure that's entirely true. Um, but remember, first of all, a lot of my books are a lot shorter than their books. So um, that doesn't mean it takes less time, it just takes less words. Uh -huh. Of course, they have to be the right ones. <laughs> um, I, I, but I've also written adult novels um, and cookbooks and music books and nonfiction and so. Well, let's talk about children's literature. I mean, what, what got you interested in that writing for children? It was actually a mistake. Uh, I thought that I was a poet and a journalist. Turned out I was a lousy journalist. Um, and you cannot get very rich in, unless you're Billy Collins writing poetry these days, certainly. But I, I heard from a college traveler, which was a person who um, goes around to the, to the universities and schools to, to sort of drum up trade for their, for their uh, publishing company. And she said that she'd been to Smith and asked, did they have any recent graduates who had um, possibilities of being, of being writers? And if she had talked to the English department, she wouldn't have been given my name particularly. But she talked to um, the head of the press board and, and the journalism person. And I had been president of the press board when I was there. And so my name was the one that, that was given. And she wrote me a letter and asked if I had any book material, and I said, she was at Knopf, uh, Judith Jones, who ended up being uh, the editor of, among other things, Julia Childs, and I said, oh yeah, I, absolutely, I have lots and lots, which was a lie, because I've been writing poetry, <laughs> I've been writing books, so I sat down and I thought, okay, she wants to see me, what can I do quickly? And so I thought, yes, children's books, I can do that quickly. Turns out, you can do children's books quickly, bad children's books. <laughs> And when I went to see her, she pointed out how bad they were. Uh, but she did dutifully take me into the children's book person who told me again how bad the ideas that I had and sent me on my way. But it sort of stuck in my mind that this was something that might be something I could do. Yeah. And in fact, the first books that I sold were all children's books. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, if, because you write both um, chapter books, what are called chapter books for, for kids, as well as picture books. And picture books have to be a really collaborative effort, I would think, versus chapter books being a more solitary effort. No? Well, the, the, the sad thing about children's picture books is that the editors try to keep the author and the illustrator apart. Oh, really? Uh, they don't give you their names, they don't give you their emails, they don't, <laughs> they don't tell you where they live because they want the illustrator to come to the, 
to the text, not to you. They don't need you telling them what to do because they want to marry the pictures and the words, not the author and the illustrator. Oh, I would think that, do you, are, are you ever disappointed in the results? Is it? I think three times. Just three times? Just three times. Maybe three hundred. Hundred. That's pretty, no, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was my first picture book. I was very disappointed. <laughs> And Eleanor Lippman, you are a master of the comic novel. You've got a really sharp eye for social satire. And when I was reading about you, uh, I kept seeing you compared to Jane Austen, which... I hate that. that. Yeah. Do you hate it? Yeah. <laughs> you like it. I love it. Yeah. Are, you, are you a big Jane Austen fan? She wants I to am. Who is it? it? Yes. And I, that, that took me... To, I, first I thought, when the first comparison, I thought, well, that must happen to everyone if you're a woman and you write, and it's considered sort of comedy of manners. But now I'm now I don't like anyone else to be compared to Jane Austen. So, <laughs> so do you think of yourself as a kind of contemporary version of Jane? Austen? I don't. I don't. Um, I, you know, I started off. I just was start with one sentence and a premise and a character, and then I go on. I didn't have any a sense of comedy of manners. It was other people who defined that for me and characterized my work that way. So, in fact, sometimes, we, and the other thing is I write and I describe something and I think it's maybe poignant and then I do a reading and people laugh at that in a good way. And so I've come to realize that what, I, you know, I'm not a good judge. I don't try to be funny. If I think I'm making a joke, I cut it out. I don't like that impulse. So, um, it sort of takes me by surprise what I'm thrilled. And in fact, the second time I do a reading, if people don't laugh at the same line, then, you know, I'm unhappy. I'm disappointed. But, I, you know, I just tell a story, and then I think it's just a sort of slightly, a, maybe a quirky worldview that people appreciate in a different way I didn't mean. Because I was going to ask you that, because I was thinking humor, it seems to me humor would be a really hard thing to write, you know, to... Uh, uh, so you're, you're saying really that it's kind of just maybe who you are or it's the way I, it just sort of comes naturally. I discovered that where, you know, I have two really close friends who read every chapter as I write them and I sent one of them a chapter and I described something that happened, a man was just about to be discharged from the hospital and his mother says, can I make the bed in the hospital room? And I meant it to characterize her as being unworldly and sympathetic and kind. And my friends read it and said, oh, that was so funny when, what's his name's mother made the bed. And that was, and it dawned on me that at that moment, and that was something like my sixth book, that that's what was going on, that what I found poignant um, or true, other people found funny. So I don't fight it, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I understand that one of your books, The Inn at Lake Divine, was based on a real experience. It was. It was. It was my family was turned away from a restricted hotel in the early 60s. And I developed it from that insult. It wasn't, I made everything up other than the letter that came that said the people who return here, year after year, and feel most comfortable are Gentiles. So I then had to make everything else up. But it came from something that really happened. Do you use your own life experiences a lot, or, or was that? I don't. I don't. I have a new book coming out in a year, and it's probably the most autobiographical. So oh. I don't know whether I'll lie when people say, you know, did that all that stuff really happen? So I guess I, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes us to nonfiction. Yeah. Tracy. <laughs> Um, uh, Tracy Kidder, you, you have been described as a literary journalist. Do you think of yourself as that? And what is that exactly? What would I don't you know. I, I don't <laughs> like the term. Can I just interrupt to say, I think he invented literary nonfiction, creative nonfiction. I, I don't, you know, I, I, the terms don't, um, none of them thrill me. Factual narratives. I, it's just deliberately kind of boring. I got to say something about poetry, though. I did try to write poetry once. I had a great teacher in college, a, a poet and a great translator named Robert Fitzgerald, and he insisted that I try to write poetry now and then. I remember I finally got one off that he seemed to like, and he, he, and 
it came back with this, in this beautiful penmanship, and it said, this is very like a poem. <laughs> did, you, did, you ever, did you ever get closer to a real poem? <laughs> or is that your last attempt at poetry? I don't know what literary or creative journalism or creative nonfiction is. I, what, what I liked about, I mean, this is a pretty old form after all. It yeah. probably goes back to Thucydides at least, you know, the Peloponnesian Wars. But if you, uh, what, I, what I loved about it early on when I was a young fellow, uh, was that it was outside the academy. It really was. It was. It had a kind of freedom to it. And when I was first starting to try my hand in it, there was a there was something out there called the new journalism, which wasn't new at all, really. Um, so people have grappled for terms. I know that one of the great, one of the really wonderful, elegant practitioners of this kind of writing, John McPhee, has quarreled even with the term nonfiction. So you know, I don't think there's much point in trying to get a name for it. Yeah. But it, you know, it, it is generally narrative. Um, I mean, it, that, that usually is the backbone of a book or an article. And, um, and in my view, as McPhee himself has said, no one makes rules for everybody. But I do think accuracy is important, at least the uh, pursuit of accuracy. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask yeah, you about yeah. one of your one of your books specifically, "The Strength and What Remains," um, which is the one I've read most recently, so it's closest in my mind. Um, but there's a character in there; his name is Deo Gracias, one a real name and one of the best names <laughs> of a character I've ever. But as I was reading that, I was thinking uh, because you're describing a lot of what's going, what he's going through uh, when he first comes to this country. He arrives with two hundred dollars in his pocket. He doesn't know English. And I wondered, and, and it reads like a narrative. It reads, it reads like a story. Um, and I did wonder, so how, do you, how do you do that? Do you, do you, do you interview him uh, intensively? Do you get to know him really well so that you can put yourself in his mind that way? How does, how does it work? Well, in that case, I mean, everything is, everyone is different. Every attempt at this. In that case, I, I relied, I told that book in two parts. Uh, the first part is really about is is all his memories, my words, his memories of of this rather extraordinary uh, life. And the second part, in the second part, I, I I talk about revisiting the stations of his life in the first person. I was kind of I, I worried about this at first, but I, one of the things that I wanted to do was to acknowledge openly the fact that, of course, the, you know the the. The freshest of these memories was 12 years old, so of course they couldn't be absolutely accurate. But I, but I wanted then to show the reader why I thought that they were, uh, as a AJ Leaving once said, in their entrails true. Uh -huh. That they had to be, in, be true in their entrails. And um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you just try to spend as much time as you can finding out who this person is and. You know, and there's always the question of trying to verify yeah. things. You know that better than I. Perhaps. Yeah. But, you know, there's this thing right now with, we all know there's been controversy around memoir, for instance, and uh, somebody writes a memoir and then it turns out, well, they lied about this or it wasn't true. And frequently, um, you know, publishers will say, you know, it's a memoir. Right? Memoir is a different animal, though. I mean, it's named for memory after all. So you don't think it has to have that same sort of... Um, well, I think I, I, the kind of rule... I wrote one once. I mean, I used to revile them uh, with, with exceptions, you know, notable exceptions. I, I think actually most people in publishing run the other way when they hear that someone's got a memoir now. Because yeah. there are so many of them. But, and then, of course, I did the obvious thing and made an exception for myself and wrote a little memoir about my <laughs> year as a soldier in Vietnam. But what, the rule that I made for myself was to be uh, as, as accurate as I could based on what documents there were and beyond that to be true to my memories, which of course I'm sure are faulty in many ways. But I don't think you can hold memoirs to quite the same standard that you should hold a, a nonfiction storyteller. You know, uh, for instance, very few memoirs don't contain large blocks of dialogue that no one could possibly have remembered. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
There, there is one notable exception, and that's, the, that's Jeffrey Wolf's wonderful book, The Duke of Deception, about his father. At, at the beginning of that book, he tells you, he said, these are his words, my father was a bullshit artist. And it must have occurred to Jeffrey that the, the, a reader might say, like father, like son, you know? So he never quotes anyone whom he couldn't have, he, he, he doesn't use quotation marks for, for, for dialogue that couldn't pos he couldn't possibly remember. He uses it only for stuff that he's probably gathered in interviews. It's very scrupulous and it, it's interesting. You know, I was going to ask each one of you if you have wanted to try the other's genre, but Jane, it sounds like you've done them all. <laughs> well, I just recently um, have done a kind of a memoir in verse, actually, which was I had never done before. Um, that'll be coming out in the fall. But but my whole take on on, on memoirs is is. But when my husband and I travel for nine months in Europe, in the Middle East, back in the '60s, in a VW bus, of course, because that's what you did. Um, and I kept a journal in because I sent home letters every couple of days to my parents, and my mother kept them. And when we got back, and my husband and I would start saying, well, do you remember when we did this? And the other one would say, no, we never did that. And then we take out the journal, and it was something else entirely, yeah. not what I remembered, not what he remembered. So that the whole idea of memory and memoir, to me, is so compromised that, and, and besides, I've led a very dull life, so <laughs> I can't imagine that anybody would be interested in that. I, you know, I've, I've never murdered anybody. I've never been near, had near-death experiences. All that sort of stuff. So, so why would I write a memoir? I mean, I spend a lot of time sitting in a room talking to invisible friends. <laughs> but you, Eleanor, have you ever have you ever been interested in writing nonfiction, or have you ever done do, any journalism? Uh, I do. I, I started as a journalist, and I do quite a few essays. And I have um, in a year, I, I have a new novel coming out, and at the same time a collection of personal essays. I still have a couple of more to do to wrap that up. So I have, and it, when people talk about, when I think about a memoir, I think, no, it'll just be short little pieces of it in memoir, in um, essays are fine for me. Now I have to ask you about your poetry. My poetry, yes. So uh, <laughs> I understand you are Twittering poetry throughout the entire I, presidential oh, campaign. I do. I started. Can you tell us June. about it? I love to. Yes. Um, in June, well, I went to this panel, and I only went to be collegial because it was I knew everybody on the panel, and it was about social networking, and it was all about how you should Twitter, and it's good if you're a novelist because you can talk about your upcoming this or that and you'll get more readers or something. So I left with them saying, you should do this. So I went home, and the minute I opened up my Twitter account, I said, I know what I'll do. I'll write, a, a, I pledged to write a political poem every day from then until the election. And I should have counted <laughs> how long that was. And I should have said five days a week instead of seven. So today was my something like 266th in a row. What did you say? Do you remember? Um, you know, I have a hard time remembering. Today was about Santorum. Of course, it's all political, and they're very biased. They're very partisan. And it, it ended the last two lines, because uh, I can't remember the whole thing. Um, Something, something about a win. Oh no, something about good. Oh, of course we'll get the Gingrich spin. Brilliant me. Brilliant me is staying in. Brilliant me being Gingrich. So it's no offense to Republicans in the audience. So um, very partisan, and it's a, yeah. So I. You know, I think of it like it's a little trip to the mental gym every morning. <laughs> but, but Ellie, Ellie, I have a question. How do you write a poem in Twitter? I mean, 40, it's like three... It's a quatrain. No, it's a quatrain and it rhymes, and it's four lines, and it rhymes. And I'm very good at scanning. I'm very disdainful of people who don't have proper meter. <laughs> well, well, I've been since January... Of 10, 2010, I've been writing a poem a day. 
but they're longer and very few of them rhyme. You know, I'm going to remember this as inspiration when I... It's, people say, how can you do it? But it really is. It primes the pump every day. You go, it's like finger exercises or ballet bar. Yeah, yeah. So I get up early and I tune in. I, I almost always write that morning, so it's the hottest, freshest news. You know, that, what you were just saying, Jane, brings me to something that Tracy and I were talking about uh, earlier tonight, which is fallow periods, you know, those moments where you may think, I'm never going to have another idea, which Tracy was saying that happens to him occasionally, but uh, does it ever, <laughs> I mean, maybe it doesn't happen to everybody. We were I, talk, never, what is a fallow period? <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, can you please tell <laughs> Jane? You can't have a fallow period if you write 300 books. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> Well, I'm really actually 300 years old. I'm twittering. I'm, I'm, I'm astonished. Are you, you going to follow me? No, I'm not going to Twitter. I refuse. I would like to write a novel, but, but I, uh, this is my saying about that, which is that it is a much less useful impulse to want to write a novel than to have a novel that you want to write. Do you have a novel that you want no, to write? No, I don't. <laughs> Nor do I have a Twitter account. And what I'm about even on Facebook? I don't have a Twitter account either, but I'm on Facebook. <laughs> well, well, what about politics? Do, do either one of you have any interest in writing about politics? Tracy, you're the journalist. Well, I'm a, I'm a right wing uh, liberal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've thought about it. I've um, looked into it. I, I, I don't. For me, you know, in my own little idiosyncratic world, I don't start with subjects. I usually try to start with people, and then I get interested in the subjects that preoccupy them, but I don't, um, I, I did once hang out with a congressman for a while, and I, I thought he'd be a pretty interesting right about, but then he ran for Senate, and I didn't think that would be very interesting. Do you think politicians are interesting enough to really spend the amount of time you have to spend? I don't know, do I really do? don't know, I haven't done it, I, some certainly are, but some are. Well, you did date Musante. I did. Uh, he wasn't there anymore. Mary Ford was was the mayor when I wrote about her. She was. Um, she once asked a question. I, I liked her a bit, uh, but I remember she was in. Bo I went to with, with her to Boston, and she asked. Uh, she was talking to the president of the Senate. And she asked a question that went on for ten minutes. And when it was done, the president of the Senate, who was a fairly witty guy, said, could you repeat that? <laughs> and the thing about it was she did, but in a shorter form that took about five minutes. <laughs> no, I haven't. I, I don't know. I'm, you know, politicians are an interesting breed, I suppose. I, I want to talk to you then. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, um, the fact that there are so many writers in this part of the world. Do you sort of, do, do, is, is that helpful to, to have other writers around you? Because writing is a really solitary exercise, ultimately. I mean, Tracy, obviously you have to go out and do a lot of research and talk to a lot of people. But then when you sit down to write, it's a solitary exercise. So is it helpful to be in a place that sort of has a community of writers? And um, I had no feel about that. I, I wanted a community so badly that when I moved here, there were only I think two or three people who wrote children's books, uh, and, and so, and so uh, I, I invented it. I mean, I invited people, I, I taught, I, I, I started a writer's group, which is still going, um, because, yes, you spend a lot of time, sort of solitary time, even though you're talking to those invisible friends, but, but um, I, I'm absolutely convinced that the, um, that, uh, I feel like a soprano who, you know, is, is able to make, make uh, glassware break. Um, I, I'm convinced that there are more children's book writers and illustrators per capita in this valley than anywhere in the known universe. Well, I went to the Eric Carle Museum this afternoon, and then I came here and realized you have the Dr. Seuss uh, is from here as well, and uh, but what do you get from having other writers around you? Um, you know, there's 
uh, there's great collegiality, and it didn't. It's not as if we get together and have writing groups. I think there was a wonderful infusion of great nonfiction writers when New England Monthly came here. So it was. Tra were you were you already here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But um, Joan O'Sara and Barry Worth and who else? And Dick Todd, of course. He'd already been here. He'd already been here. That's why he came here, I guess. And then, I don't know, you'd meet a couple and then the, one of the very nicest things is when any of us has a reading at the broadside, then everybody comes. And so it's more, um, I, I would say it's more social than uh, workshoppy professional. It's just... And you have somebody to you have somebody to complain to too, and they understand what you're complaining about. So you talk a lot about terrible editors and money. I, I you know, I, I went to the um, I probably should have been. I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop years ago in the early 1970s, and I I began to think there was a critical mass of writers beyond which you know, things were really get pretty scary. And uh, when we moved, to, when I moved out here in 1976, there weren't very many writers around. Um, I don't mind there not being a lot of writers around, actually. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I enjoy the company of writers. Yeah. They see the world in, uh, in interesting ways. But and they're usually uh, free during the day. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. That's part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tracy, drink but that. But have to have someone to drink with. <laughs> there you go. Writers have to have someone. I mean, during those periods when you're feeling uh, that you, you don't know what you're going to write next, or you know, you, you have those, how do you how do you break that kind of? Um, oh, I, you know, something happens. I, I finally get off my rear end and go out into the world. I, I don't know. It varies. It's it's always been different. Do you have to make yourself write? I guess that's what I'm wondering. I mean, does can you, and this is for all three of you, anyone can answer, but it, it, you know, if you're having a feeling like that, do you just sort of say, okay, I can't write, and walk away from it for as long as you have to? Or do you say, no, I've got to sit down and write, like writing is a discipline, I just have to do it every day, and eventually I'll get to something that I really like? Yeah, I, I have a goal of 500 words a day, and one of my very early workshop leaders that I took back at Brandeis Adult Ed said, uh, prepare to write badly. So I sort of recite that every day, that you don't feel like it, you don't feel as if there is something at the tip of your fingers, you don't know what's coming next in the novel, but you just better do it. And there's a big, and also I know from years of doing this that it's worth it for the mood I'm in when I've done it. That there's, you know, sort of before and, you know, sort of uh, the sad sack writer who hasn't done her daily quota versus that feeling of accomplishment. So it's worth it. It has its own rewards. So, you know, disciplined. I, but I, I, I write so differently from that. I absolutely feel so much joy when I'm creating something that I look up and I've Five hours has gone by, and I have no idea where it's gone. Um, uh, when I'm when I'm working, it's like I'm I'm flying. It's the greatest high in the world, which is probably why I keep doing it. Um, but but I know that there are writers who who you know there are writers who feel they're bleeding onto the page, and there are writers who feel that it's 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 a knife in the gut. And I think, why would I do it then? Because I you know. I don't want to make myself unhappy. Some of them say it's because they have to write, and some of them say, as, as Ellie does, that she feels so wonderful when she's actually gotten it down. But I think the most important thing is that you just give yourself over to it um, because that's what you do. And if you're not doing it, um, then you have two options. You can not do it and spend your day thinking about how you haven't done it, or you go and do something wonderful and breathe in the world, and that gives you more stuff to write about. You know, I interviewed the uh, novelist Ann Tyler yesterday, which was very exciting for me, and she said something I thought was interesting. She said, I'm never happier than when I'm in the middle of a novel. 
um, not the beginning, and, and she doesn't like it to end, but she said, I'm never happier. When I go, when I die and go to heaven, I want, I want there to be a novel in, the, you know, in, in medias res that I can delve into. Um, Carol Shields, the wonderful oh, novelist, she said the same thing. Yeah. And she might have even said that there, it's actually three quarters because you still have some time to go, but maybe you can sort of see where you're going. Because for those of us who don't know where we're going, being three quarters of the way through is um, nice, uh, you know, a, a nice signpost. But at a certain point, it just it it, it, it just kind of takes it does take you over. Do you yeah. Feel? Oh, well, Jane feels that way. I, think, right? <laughs> I hate middles. I hate middles because that's the slog part for me. It is. But I love beginnings because it's new and bright and shiny and everything is possible. Middles are a slog. And then when you get up that you reach that, you know, that peak in Darien where you can see, yeah. you can see the, the beautiful sea, but, you know, before you and you're starting downhill and it's a rush. It's a huge rush. You may be still writing crap, but it's a huge rush. Yeah, the three quarters, I think, it would be my favorite spot, too. Yeah. Tracy, I would think that the process would be really different for someone writing nonfiction because you've had to do a lot of research. So you're taking all that research, and, and then you're, you want to turn it into a story. In your case, you're not just writing pure nonfiction. You want to turn it into a story. Yeah. So how do you... Well, I, it, my life is roughly divided into two parts. One is doing research, and the other is writing. And they're quite different. I don't feel uh, compulsion to write every day, except when I'm, it's time for me to start writing, and then I do. But I have a very hard time writing a rough draft of things. So I write it as fast as I can in order to prevent remorse for having written badly. <laughs> I have this editor who's been in for 40 years named Richard Todd and uh, I give him chunks of it and he pretends to have read it and says keep it fine keep going and I'll start over again but I uh, and you know I, I believe in rewriting it's uh, for me you know I'm a little bit of a slow learner I think uh, but I remember reading uh, F, F. Scott Fitzgerald's um, fragment uh, you know his unfinished novel The Last Tycoon and a, a note that he left in the margin, which was about a chapter, he said, has grown stilted from rewriting, rewrite, don't look, rewrite from mood. And I believe in that kind of rewriting, where you just throw it away and start over again. It's, nothing is really lost. And when I, the few times I've taught, I've always, t students are often reluctant to rewrite. Um, but what I try to explain to them is that there's no other department of life where you get to take back what you've said and think of how to say it better before anyone else has to see it. It's the, the spring de l'escalier, as the, the French say, you know, the retort you thought of on the staircase, but you actually get to do it. Do, right. do, you, write, re -write, do you write the whole book and then rewrite, or do you I try to do that for a rough draft, and, then, and then, yeah, I usually get through the whole thing, and it's, you know, it's a sort of successive approximations. But I've got this person who I trust. Me too. Who's very You're funny. You're an editor. You got an editor you trust? I, I, I do have an editor that I trust, but it's two very dear friends, and they're both oh. wonderful, accomplished writers. One is um, Pulitzer Prize winner Stacy Schiff, who oh. and she was my editor. I used to call her the girl editor. She was 25 when she was my editor. So they read, and Mamie Medwed, the novelist, so they read it a chapter at a time as I write it, and I trust A them. lot of writers have first readers. Do you have first readers? No, not other writers. I just have this one guy. Otherwise, I'd get confused. But I use... Um, <laughs> Toward the ends of things, I used Stuart Dybeck, my wonderful short story writer. Um, and I, I used to read to my wife, but she has a disconcerting habit of falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a problem. <laughs> Jane, you, you know I, Well, I have a writer's group with oh, okay. Patricia McLaughlin and Leslie and Newman and Ann Turner and uh, Corinne Demas and, and Ellen Whitlinger and uh, Barbara Diamond Gold and Anna Kerwin. Um, but I can only read short things there, um, picture books um, uh, or poetry, that sort of thing. Because if I'm working on a novel, I don't like to read the opening of it because the opening may change. And if they start nudging me about parts of it, um, I don't want to get so involved with redoing that 
when I'm, I'm, I'm really seeing it linearly and I need to get moving. So I have a, a beta reader um, who reads the novel when it's done. And she's a well-published uh, novelist in Scotland. And I just ship it over to her and she reads it and tears it apart for me. So I wanted to ask you all a little bit about all the changes that are going on in publishing now as a result of uh, the transition to um, digital books and digital publishing. Oops. <laughs> some, you know, some writers really see it as an opportunity. I mean, especially young writers who have not been able to get their books to a publisher and haven't been able to get their books before the public. They're self-publishing. Uh, they're going on Amazon or, or uh, there are other sites, Smashwords, I think is another one. I mean, how do you, how do you view what's going on? Tracy, do you think it's a good thing? Uh, I don't know. I really don't understand you know, it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, could be. I, I expect it'll be a mixed thing, you know. For me, I, I but I am glad that I'm at this end, this end of my career rather than the other one. I, I don't, I really don't understand what's going. I've been a kind of luddite about all of these things. I really don't. Um, I don't even have a one of those readers, you know, a Kindle. An e-reader. E but I probably will because I'm getting. I wonder how many people in the audience have e-readers. Yeah. You can enlarge the type. That's yeah, yeah. You can do a whole lot. There's <laughs> a lot of things you can do with that tracing. And <laughs> <laughs> but I don't really, and then I really don't have a clue. I, and I'm suspicious of people who think they do, frankly. I, I, I mean, our publishers are running scared. They don't know what's going what to what's gonna happen. I suspect there will always be printed books. My fear is that there will be the economies of scale for a lot of books have ever been economies of scale, but that, that they will become much more expensive. But there are people, at least for another generation or two, who will want actual physical books. Jane, you did this gesture when I said that. I, Why? Yeah, I, first of all, it's, it's what all anybody um, who's writing and in publishing is speaking about now. I have this actually a vision of um, uh, Steve Jobs and Gutenberg up in heaven, <laughs> uh, sitting, having a beer. Steve Jobs is not in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gutenberg probably is neither. Um, having, having a beer and talking about the delivery of story. I mean, that's, and that's what we're talking about, the delivery of story. Uh, but as a writer whose husband's pension died with him, um, I'm concerned about this new thing that I just read, I think it was in The Guardian, where they're saying um, the days of writers being paid for their writing is gone. And now everybody should give away their writing for free. And I'm saying Who said that? it was in there was a stupid article somewhere that I read. There are people who are saying that. There are people who are saying that. I, I think there are many ways to deliver story. Mm -hmm. um, but but what I fear more than anything. Um, in this, we're calling it the de de democratization of, of publishing. But as we found in schools, when you tell everyone they're equally wonderful and then they're surprised when they can't be the quarterback on the football team because they have no talent, but they can't. I have a, I have a granddaughter who is beautiful and smart um, and a gorgeous dancer, but she can't sing. And she wants to sing, but she is tone deaf. You know, now I can't tell her that she sings wonderfully. She knows she's a lousy singer, but she'd love to sing. There are a lot of tone deaf writers out there who are self-publishing, and I'm afraid the bar is getting lower and lower and lower, and that's what I worry about. Also, what I love is books, the physicality of books. I can't cozy up to a nook or a Kindle, but I can sniff my new book when it's out, and I can stroke it, and I can even lick it if I want to. I mean, it's just very sensual. Borges' great line is, I cannot sleep in the surrounding books. You know, I find, I was on a panel in Greenwich, Connecticut last April, and it was called, Is the Book Dead? And there were a lot of these sort of um, 
you know, there was a man who was a columnist for Wire magazine, so I did my homework and I did, and I hadn't even looked to see which of my books were already on ebooks because I really was sort of afraid to know. Now I'm very glad that they are. I think that people are reading more, but they're reading their email and they're reading newspapers online. Is that good or is that bad? I know that when I'm, I take the subway all the time in New York, and I will be sitting between two well-dressed business people, and what are they doing? They're doing solitaire on their iPhone on the subway, and hardly anyone is reading a book, and I think that um, there will always be people, there will always be readers, and there will always be books, but I just think that this part of it is actually not dying, but um, getting there. And the one thing that I think, in terms of children's books, there's always, you know, the, the, the child who toddles across the room and goes to the bookshelf and takes the favorite book and says again and wants to read it for the tenth time. So I think that'll save us, that we're sort of raised and raising our children to read books, but I think that e-books are the future. But you know, Ellie, the, the thing that disturbs me about what's happening with children and books is that now all the publishers are going towards and trying to figure out how to do apps and, and to do um, books on, on, on Kindle and whatever. And, but they want, in order to do it, they want to add stuff mm -hmm. um, because children like to push buttons. And so what you're doing is you're breaking the arc of the book. Um, the story that I'm telling is now being interrupted. Um, I have a book, Al Moon, and it's, it's a very simple arc, but it's a child going out with the father uh, to go out owling. And, and the arc is just like that. So you're saying the technology, this was a question I had, is actually affecting the content. Now, the, so the content, if they, t if they do Al Moon, they're going to want to say, Oh, all right. There are this many kinds of owls in the world. This is what an owl feather looks like. This is what the various owls sound like. This is uh, all, these are all the animals that you can find on the pages of this book that are hidden. These are the sounds they make. This is how many babies they have. This is what when and by that time there's no story left. You might as well just have an encyclopedia thing, but it's, there's no story. So I'm afraid of of um, that happening. Uh, they're already calling writers content providers. And well, does any, I, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna stop right there so we have time. If anybody has any questions for these content providers up here. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna let you know that, that uh, we have a mic here and uh, I didn't mean to end on that note because that was sort of a, a downer, a little bit of a down note. So maybe somebody in the audience can take us up again here with our content providers. I, I have a question for the audience. Can I ask? How can I sign your Kindle? <laughs> I, you know what, I actually saw somebody sign a Nook the other day. Had a, had a light colored... Um, but what did they sign? I mean, where did they sign? She signed her name. And you know who it was? I'm gonna tell you who it was. No, but it was but Jody you, Pico, was, who sells yes. like a billion books. But, but <laughs> if, you, if you sign it, you're signing on some, you could probably sign on somebody else's story. I, I was standing there, and I, I was, I was, I went to a, 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 an event with Jody Pico, and then there was signing afterwards, and I was getting sounds of people saying hello to her, and a young woman came up and said, would you sign my nook? And she said, okay, I even have a pen, and she had a, she had a light colored pen that would show up on the nook, so get yourself the right kind of magic marker, and you can do it. <laughs> Anyway, that's my little story. Any questions? We can keep talking. Yeah, well then, you know, I don't care if people read on, on electronically or however they read, but I do believe that if you don't read and you don't read, I mean, the great thing about literature is it's the best that, that a whole, that people have, human beings have known and thought, and recorded one way or another, not to say that we, we can tell in the contemporary world, you know, among contemporary authors who, who deserves to have their work last and so on, but. I, I really believe that if you don't read serious, and I mean in, in that comic writing as well, um, 
you don't read real writing, your brain turns to mush. And I've seen it happen. <laughs> yeah. But you know, some of the most avid readers are the people who, or the, the, you know, the, the early uh, adapters of uh, uh, electronic readers of Kindles were the most avid That's readers. My agent, I don't have any one. my agent got one early, but then she was hurting her back carrying all these manuscripts. Yeah. And it's an instant read. You read a review, you go online, you get that book. And it was sort of first there was book of the month. First you'd have to go to the bookstore, and then there was book of the month club. It would arrive at your house, and then Amazon. But they still had to mail it to you, and now it's instant. So that's I think a huge attraction. Uh, but now we have to ask ourselves: Is instant? What we, what we should be going for. But you know, I find that when people say, oh, and the book, and I love the feel of it, and it so means so much to me, 30-year-olds don't say that. 20-year-olds don't say that. Right. It tends it's, to it's be an age thing. It's an age thing. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Let me uh, say a word for this new development in, in, as a way How do you construct uh, your 
I tried to use voice recognition for notes, you know, it was really bizarre. <laughs> it, 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 when I last tried it, it wasn't very uh, accurate. Um, I think you have to teach funny, it. Actually. I think you have to teach it uh, yeah. how to recognize 